All right, the recording has started. So let's take a moment just to um, pray together and uh, we will get started. Uh, could uh, any one of us just uh, please unmute your mic and lead us in a moment of prayer together, please? Anybody can do that. Okay, Rosalind, why don't you please pray and we'll get started. Yes, let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. Thank you for this beautiful morning. Thank you for this day. Thank you for your grace upon our lives. Daddy, we come before you in the name of Jesus. Father God, as we have gathered here to study your word, I pray, grant us your grace, grant us your understanding, your spiritual understanding. Help give us the spirit of wisdom and knowledge that we may know, we may know you, we may know your word. I also pray, Lord God, anoint our dear pastor as he teaches us your word. Speak through his mouth. Lord, thank you. Thank you for hearing our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, good morning. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks for connecting to the class. All right, so in this course, uh, we are talking about our identity in Christ. Uh, we're making progress uh, week after week as we um, discover from the Word of God uh, what God has done for us in Christ, what is the inheritance he has given to us in Christ. And we're also learning how to live out of that inheritance and ident the identity and inheritance he has given to us in Christ. How do we live out of that? And that's, that's the Christian life. The Christian life is a life that we live out of our identity and inheritance in Christ. That's what the Christian life is all about. So, We've been uh, journeying through it. Last week, we spent almost all of our time in Romans chapter 5 and Romans chapter 6. We started going through that. Uh, we were talking about identification. And uh, I just want to quickly review, and then we go forward. We talked about, from Romans chapter 5, uh, we talked about this truth of identification. That is the entire human race is identified in the first man, Adam. And whatever happened to Adam is passed on to the entire human race. So Adam sinned and uh, because of that came condemnation, judgment, subjection to sin and Satan and death. So everything from sin to death came upon the human race because of one man, Adam. But Adam was only a type of the real man, the man with a capital M, that is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's called the second uh, man, and he's called the last Adam, because in Jesus Christ, Adam's race comes to an end, and a new man begins, that is in the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. So those of us who, from Adam's race, become believers, who are born again, born from above, we now are identified with not the first man, Adam, but with the second man, who is the Lord from heaven. Natural, in the natural, we're all identified with Adam. But those who have experienced spiritual birth, who are born again, who are born from heaven, are identified with the last Adam, the second man, who is Jesus Christ. And being identified in Christ, Romans 5 tells us that we receive the free gift of God, salvation, eternal life, the gift of righteousness, abundance of grace. And all of this puts us over, puts us in a place of authority and dominion 
because we are in Christ. So that's our identity and that's our inheritance through identification, through this truth of identification. But then Paul doesn't stop there in Romans 5. He goes on into Romans 6 and he says, okay, I, uh, I want you to know something more. Let's go into a little bit more detail. Not, not only are we identified with Christ in order to receive the free gift of God and righteousness and grace and salvation and eternal life and all of that, but I also want you to know something. We're identified with Christ in his death, in his burial, in his resurrection, in his ascension, and in his exaltation or seating at the right hand of the Father. And uh, we saw this in detail from Romans chapter 6. And each of these stages, us being identified with Christ in each of these stages, has an implication, has a meaning for us. It, is, it impacts our life today in a very powerful way. To be crucified with him means that the old man is crucified, so that the power of sin over our lives has been done away with, so that we no longer need to serve sin. We are free from the power of sin over our lives. And the reason you and I can resist sin and, and resist every form of uncleanness is because of this. The old man is gone. It's dead. The power of sin over my life, over our lives, has been broken. We are buried with him. That means the old life has no more claim over us. It's gone. We have transitioned from darkness to light. The dark, darkness has no more claim over your life. We are resurrected with him, which means God has raised us up to walk in newness of life. This new life is the life of God, Zoe. It's the God kind of life. So you and I are living the Zoe life, the God kind of life. It's in us. We've got to learn to walk in it. And then we are raised up with him, which means we are taken out of the influence of this world system. So this, those systems of this world, the systems of evil and rebellion, the darkness of this world, no longer has power over you and me. So we are in the world, but we are not in subjection to what's in the world. We don't have to be because we've been raised up with Christ. And as believers, we can live above the influences of this world. I'm not saying it's not there. It is there around us. But we're not subject to it because spiritually we've been raised up with Christ. And we've been made to sit together with Christ, which means we are in a place of authority and dominion. And from that place, we exert spiritual authority, spiritual dominion, spiritual influence into this realm. So having understood this truth of identification, what are we supposed to do? Romans chapter 6, Paul, of course, says in Romans 6 and verse 6, he says, I want you to know this. So obviously, you know, uh, when we uh, study the word of God together, uh, we get to know this truth. And believers need to know this truth everywhere, all over the world. God's people need to know uh, this truth of identification. So Romans 6 and verse 6, knowing this, so we must know it. But once we know it, what are we supposed to do with it? Uh, verse 11, he says, reckon yourself to be dead to sin. That means you count it as a fact. I am dead to sin. This is this is reality. This is truth. I have nothing to do with sin. I'm dead to sin. I'm alive to God. I have nothing to do with sin. I'm, I have everything open. I'm open to God. I'm dead to sin. Alive to God. And verse 12, therefore, I'm not going to give sin any place in me. Do not let sin reign in your mortal body. Sin, you have no place in me because I'm dead to sin, alive to God. So reckon that is counted as a fact. Embrace this truth and give no sin no place in your body. And then he says in verse 13, present yourself as a weapon of righteousness to God, which will result in holiness. So you say, God, I'm all yours. 
every part of me, every my hands, my feet, my eyes, my ears, every part of me, my part of me is yours. I present myself as an instrument of righteousness. And uh, uh, so that Vivian, we went till that uh, point. I want to just, uh, uh, and I think we also, yeah, we also talked about verse 17, where Paul, Romans 6, and I'm looking at Romans chapter 6, where Paul uh, explains that you were once slaves, but verse 18, now you have been set free. You were once slaves, but now you're set free from sin. You are slaves of sin, you're set free, you're set free from sin. How did that happen? Because you obeyed from the heart. Romans 6, verse 17. You obeyed from the heart. This doctrine, this form of doctrine that was given to you. So we explained that the word form means um, type. It's a mold. Uh, it's a dye. So uh, this teaching that is brought to people shapes their life. So they move from being slaves of sin to being set free from sin. And so as we live out of this truth, what happens? We are able to present ourselves as slaves to God. We're no longer slaves to sin, but we are slaves to God, resulting in holiness. That is Romans 6 verse 19, the latter part. And, uh, yeah, and also verse 22, we are walking in holiness before God. So you're with me so far? Uh, I just did a quick uh, review of what we spoke last week. Everything is clear, any questions? Okay, all right. So, so that we, we, we covered all of this. And then we, but then uh, Paul doesn't stop here. He brings us this revelation. And then he continues through into chapter 7 and chapter 8. Uh, there is one problem. There is one problem. The power of sin over our lives has been broken. But there's still one problem. And the problem is the weakness of our flesh, which he mentions here in Romans 6 verse 19. So the truth of identification deals with the power of sin over us and it sets us free. But we are still living in a body, a physical body. And the physical body has its appetites, its desires. And the ungodly desires Ungodly appetites of the physical body is what is characterized by the word flesh. That's Romans 6 verse 19. He says, I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. So he's saying, okay, I understand there is the weakness of the flesh. So our human body, we're living in this physical body. This physical body has desires. There are good desires and there are wrong desires, evil desires. You know, there are natural desires. You, you know, you, you, you eat, you desire for food, uh, rest, uh, things of that nature. There's nothing wrong with that. But even good things could become evil desires if it's not controlled, if it's not within boundaries that God set for it. And so that's when these, these the desires of the body which are evil, which are ungodly, which are not pleasing to God, the Bible refers to them as flesh. And we all have the weakness of our flesh. So what do we do with it? Now, in Romans chapter 7, I'm, I'm just going to quickly summarize Romans chapter 7. Paul is uh, talking about life under the law as an unsaved man. 
So in Romans 7, he's talking about living under the law as an unsaved man. This was his life. It was a good life, meaning it, it, he, he was a Pharisee. He was a man who studied the law, who wanted to serve God. He sought after God. He was a good, good man in, in the natural, good man, good person. He was under the law. But he realized something. And I'm just summarizing Romans chapter 7. You can read it and look at it in detail. But he realized something. He said, you know, in my, in, with my inward man, I want to do what's right before God. But I find something stronger in my flesh. I find that sin is dwelling in my flesh. So he's talking about these evil desires that are controlled by, by sin sinful desires in the flesh. So he says, in my heart, I want to do God. So this is in Romans chapter 7. Uh, and uh, verse 17, 18 to 20, 17 to 24. Okay, let's read that. Romans chapter 7. Verses 17 to 24. Could somebody read this passage for us, please? But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good, I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the will I will not to do, that I practice. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warning against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Mm. I yeah, thank you. So this is Paul's struggle as a man living under the law. Now remember, he's not born again. This Romans chapter 7 is not talking about his born again life. It's talking about his life under the law. And you can, you'll pick it up if you read the first part of Romans 7. He talks about being under the law and not walking the newness of the spirit. So under the law, he knew what was right and wrong. He desired to do what was right before God, like he, we saw here. You know, um, I, I want, I delight in the law of God. Verse 22, I delight in the law of God, according to the inward man. But there is a problem. There is a law of sin. That means there is something that is controlling me in my, my, my body, my flesh. And so what happens? Even though in my heart, inside me, I want to do what's right. Paul is saying, I always end up doing what is wrong. So he cries out, oh, who will deliver me from this? So what is happening, and I'm just summarizing Romans chapter 7, that he wants to do what's good. He knows what is good. He wants to do what's good. But sin is dwelling in his members, in his body. And uh, so what happens? He yields to sin, and it only results in death. So that's what he refers to at verse 24. Who will deliver me from this body of death, my death-doomed body? Because sin is working in my body, and the result of sin is always death. So two things are happening in his body. Sin is controlling him, and his body is death-doomed, because sin always results in death. It's 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 producing decay. It's, it's pulling him down. The body's being destroyed because of sin. 
So what is the answer? So then that's where he points to Jesus Christ in verse 25, Romans chapter 7, verse 25. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 7, verse 25. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So now he's telling, look, if I move from being under the law to coming under Jesus Christ, things are going to change. The sin that is working in my flesh, producing death, will no longer have its power. So in my inner man, the power of sin has, in Christ, the power of sin has been broken, he's been set free. We know that we can live out of that truth. How are we going to live out of that truth? Romans 8, verses 1 and 2. So let's read Romans chapter 7, verse 25, and Romans 8, 1 and 2, these three verses. Somebody could read for us, please. Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature a slave to the law of sin. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. All right. So uh, in our lecture notes, we are now moving into, uh, let me just quickly show it to you before I start uh, explaining. Uh, we now are moving into this one, uh, section six, which is the spirit of life in Christ. Okay, so what we have just fit done is we have finished Romans six, which is this identified with Christ, that notes, which is less than zero five. We've completed that, identified with Christ, which is basically a close look at Romans chapter five and six. And now I'm starting lesson number seven, that is LO6. Spirit of life in Christ. Okay? Uh, and we're going to go through this, the law of the Spirit, right? So, we just read Romans 8, 1 and 2, right? So, uh, what the Apostle Paul is telling here, in Romans 7, verse 25, he says, I thank God through Jesus Christ that uh, Though, you know, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm in my inner mind, there's the law of God and there's the law of sin working in the flesh. But, verse Romans 8, 1 and 2, what's happening? There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ. So now he's talking about his life in Christ. What's happening in Christ? You do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So here's the difference. Under the law, he, he always ended up doing things according to the flesh. Because he knew what was right and wrong, but he had no power to overcome the sin that was in his flesh. But now, in Christ Jesus... In, that's what we're talking about, in Christ Jesus. What about those of us who are in Christ Jesus? We do not walk according to the flesh. So, we all have the flesh, we have our body, and the uh, sinful desires of the body, that's what flesh is. Now, you know, some translations translate the word flesh as sinful nature, and in some way that, that translation is misleading because the word flesh there is the word sarx in Greek and, and it just talks about anything that having to do with the body. Sarx means flesh, physical flesh. So when you translate that word flesh as nature, sometimes it's misleading. So you need to, in your mind, you need to tell, okay, it's talking about desires of the sinful desires of the flesh and the soul, you know, those kinds of things. Anyway, Verse 1, it says, those of us who are in Christ Jesus, we do not walk according to the flesh. That means there is the flesh, 
we all live in a body and uh, we have a soul and there are all these evil app desires. It's the weakness of our flesh, but we don't walk according to it. But instead we walk according to the spirit, according to the spirit. And what about the spirit? Verse two, Romans eight, verse two, the law of the spirit of life. In Christ Jesus. So in Christ you have the spirit of life. And the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Has made me or made us free. From the law of sin and death. So. Remember in chapter 7. Towards the end he said look. There is the law of sin in my body. That means the word law could be understood as dominion or control or influence. So the law of sin in my body. And it was resulting in death. So sin and death, the law of sin and death. So my body, my flesh, my body was controlled by sin and only produced death in my body. But in Christ Jesus, what has happened? Um, the law of the spirit of life, the influence, the dominion, the prevailing influence of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free. Okay, let me mute Silitoli. All right, so the prevailing influence of the spirit of life in Christ has set me free from the law of sin and death. The law of the spirit of life. The law, you understand the word law as meaning influence, control, uh, dominion. So the influence or the dominion of the spirit of life Spirit of the Holy Spirit is the life giving spirit. Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. That's what we're studying in Christ. What does He do? He sets us free from the law of sin and death. So I want us to understand this is very, very important. So identification with Christ is a provision given to us by God. It provisionally, that means God has provided for our freedom from sin. God has provided for us the ability to walk free from the past life. God has provided for us the ability to walk in newness of life through resurrection. With Christ. Through our ascension with Christ, God has provided for us to live free from the influence of darkness in this world. And through our seating with Christ, God has provided for us the ability to walk in dominion and authority. So identification is God's provision for you and me. But in order to walk in that provision, we have to do something. The challenge is in the weakness of our flesh. <clears throat> There's sin working in our flesh. And, uh, you know, we are so used to giving in to those desires. But now, we must break free from that and instead live out of what God has provided for us. But how do we do it? We cannot do it by our own strength, as Paul explains in Romans 7, when he was under the law, he knew what was right and wrong, but he didn't have the power to do it. But we can do it through our life in Christ Jesus. So he says, thanks be to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Because for those who are in Christ, we don't walk according to the flesh. The flesh doesn't control us. But we walk according to the Spirit. How? Because the spirit of life in Christ 
sets us free from the law or the dominion or the control of sin and death over our bodies. So the key here is this. We must learn to walk in the spirit of life. In the spirit of life. Then we can walk free from the law of sin and death. So Romans 8, 1 and 2. We are free from the law of sin. The law of the spirit of life in Christ has made me free from the law of sin. From the law of sin. We are free from the law of sin. And this is what we had read, you know, in Romans chapter 7. He'd been talking about that sin working in my members. Uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's producing death. There was the law of sin in Romans 7 he talked about. But the spirit of life sets us free from the law of sin, which he had referred to in Romans chapter 7. So this is the key. And we're going to talk more about this, about you know how do we walk according to the Spirit. But this is the key. And you and I walk by the empowering of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We can walk free from the dominion of sin over our flesh. God has set us free, and the Holy Spirit now comes and empowers us to live in that freedom. Okay, so let me pause before I go forward. Is, are things clear? Any questions? Are you all with me so far? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Okay, it's clear so far. So, the spirit of life, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death. Okay, so we must understand what is the law? Okay, that, that's a question here. Um, what does the law of the spirit of life mean? So, Zillit the, the the word law, you can understand as influence or dominion. So law, don't law, don't think of it as uh, Old Testament law. That's not what he's talking about. The law means the control, the influence, the dominion. So you can read that phrase as the control of the spirit of life or the influence of the spirit of life, the, uh, the, the positive uh, influence of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus sets me free from the law, the control of sin and death. If you, you can understand it that way, right? So Romans 8 verse 2, the influence of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the influence of sin and death, or if you want to use a stronger word, the control or the dominion of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the control or dominion of sin and death. So that's the, that's the answer, right? That's the key. Uh, he, so he says, look, sin was controlling me in my flesh. So I couldn't do the good things I wanted to do. But in Christ Jesus, there's something more powerful than sin that controlled my flesh. It's the spirit of life, the life-giving Holy Spirit. He exerts his influence in me, in you as a believer. And he liberates us. He sets us free from the control of sin and death that was at work in our body. Is that clear? Okay, good. Right? So, Romans chapter 8 is very important because it is telling us how to walk 
in the provision of identification. How to live it out with the help of the Holy Spirit. Right? So first, remember, the spirit of life sets us free from the law of sin. The first part, the law of sin, the influence of sin. So Romans chapter 6 said, you know, we are sin, we are free from sin. And uh, sin will not have any dominion over you uh, because of you were crucified with Christ and you were, you were dead with him and you were resurrected. And so sin will have no control over you. So that was a powerful announcement in Romans 6. But we know, uh, you know, in our flesh, we are struggling with it. Our flesh is so used to living in sin. So for many people, Romans chapter 6 seems like, oh, how do I live in it? How do I walk in it? Well, the answer is there in Romans 8. When the Holy Spirit, when he yielded to the spirit of life, he is the one who enables us to walk free from the law of sin. So the word walk is important. Walk means how we conduct our everyday life. We walk in our everyday life. We're not walking out of the flesh, but we're walking according to the spirit because the spirit of life, he enables us to live free from the law of sin. And we, we will get into the little details on how do I do this practically. But the answer is walk with the help of the Holy Spirit. So not only did he set us free from the law of sin, but he also sets us free from the law of death. What does that mean? We have to understand it, of course, in the context of Romans chapter 7. In uh, Romans 7, what Paul had already told us was that Sin working in his body produced death in me. So just as a reference, if you want, uh, let's read Romans 7 verse 13. Romans 7 verse 13. Somebody can read that. Has then what is good become death to me? Certainly not. But sin, that it might appear sin, was producing death in me through what is good, so that sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. Okay. Thank you. So I just want you to see that phrase, sin was producing death in me. Now, the context there, of course, is the law, that the law enhanced the power of sin. You know, sin became very strong because... Uh, the law basically said this is right and this is wrong. And uh, sin, you know, was accentuated because the law just made it stand out. Uh, but the verse 13 says, sin was producing death in me. So what happened? The result of sin is always death. Sin doesn't give us life. Sin always gives us death, the result, the outcome. So sin controlling our flesh, our body, as we just give in to that, what happens? We are actually dying. It's producing death in our body, physical body. But it says here that the law, Romans 8, to the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin. It didn't just stop there. It also says, and death. What is this and death? He had mentioned it earlier in Romans 7. That means when sin works in our body, it only results in death. Things that destroy, things that are destructive. Death simply means things that are destructive, right? Things that are destroying our, our body. And of course, ultimately, it's death, meaning physical death and spiritual death. So sin working in us produce death, physical and spiritual. It's working death, things that are decaying. But in Christ Jesus, you and I have the influence of the Holy Spirit, which we are just talking about, of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And he has made us free from the law of sin, the control of sin, and death. So I'm emphasizing this and death part, because many people... You know, we stop with the law of sin, but hey, it doesn't stop there. It says, and death. That means you've got something more also. And Paul explains this in Romans chapter 8. 
uh, verses 10 and 11. Could somebody read that for us? Romans 8, 10 and 11, please. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So notice he's saying, see Christ is in you. We are in Christ. Christ is in us. The body is dead because of sin. The body, our physical body, is dead because of sin. So what's happening to our physical body? Now, it's not yet dead in the sense that it's, you know, lifeless, but it is dying. It is death doomed, like he spoke about in Romans 7, because of sin. So sin is producing death in me. Romans 7 verse 13 and uh, uh, Romans 7 24, which we read earlier, uh, there's death working in our body because of sin. But uh, the spirit is alive, spirit is life. And what else happens? If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. So the Holy Spirit, the spirit of life is dwelling in you. What, what does he do? He who raised Christ from the dead also gives life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So the Holy Spirit not only set me free from the law of sin, he is also setting me free from the death part. So I want you to understand this. Sin working in our body is producing death. But the Holy Spirit dwelling, living in us, not only sets us free from the influence of sin, the control of sin, but he's also giving life to this body, to this mortal body. That means this body can manifest the life of God. Now, it doesn't mean this body will never die. Of course, we are all going to die physically one day. Or we understand the body is aging and, you know, uh, we will live out the full course of our life and we, are, we will all have to die. The Bible tells us it is appointed unto man once to die. So we will die physically. So uh, don't misunderstand. We are not saying our bodies won't die. What I want us to understand is that while we live in this body, the Holy Spirit sets us free from the law of sin and death. Death is caused by sin working in our body. It's destructive, but the Holy Spirit is giving life. So in Christ Jesus, the Holy Spirit is giving life. And Paul writes about this elsewhere in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 10 and 11. Let's read this. I'll share a little bit and then we'll go for a break. Somebody could read 2 Corinthians 4, 10 and 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 10 to 11. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be, may be manifested in our mortal flesh. Amen. Mm. So, think about what Paul is saying. And I'll just highlight, you know, because he repeats this in both these verses. I'll, I'll highlight it, and then we will look at it. See, he says, the life of Jesus may be manifested in our body. The life of Jesus may be manifested in our mortal flesh. Now, he's talking about the fact that he has been persecuted so much. He says, you know, we're carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. We are delivered to death for Jesus' sake. So, you know, Paul's ministry, how in many places he was beaten, he was stoned, and so on. But 
he has some other understanding. And it is that while all this is happening to him in his body, the life of Jesus is being manifested. One great example is in Acts chapter 14, you know, um, when uh, I think it was an Iconium, and when, when Paul and his, uh, goes there, he is actually stoned and he's, he's taken out of the city and uh, he's stoned and he is left for dead. Oh, so this is an actually, uh, uh, he was in Lystra. This is Acts 14, 19 and 20. Acts chapter 14, verse 19 and 20. Can somebody read that for us, please? Acts 14, 19 and 20. Then but Jews came from, from Antioch and... Go ahead, go ahead. Thank you. Then Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there and having persuaded the multitudes, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. Verse 20. However, when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up and went into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. Okay. Think about this. So this they were in the city of Lystra, and uh, uh, the, there were Jews who came from another city, uh, two other cities, Antioch and uh, Iconium, they were not too far from Lystra. They came, they caught Paul, they dragged him out of the city and they stoned him. Stoned him means they didn't throw one small stone. They stoned him means there must have been, you know, at least, I don't know, 25 people throwing stones at Paul. They stoned him. That's how they killed people. Remember, they stoned Stephen. So they stoned Paul and they left him as dead. That's verse 19. It says there in verse 20, the disciples gathered around him. And it says, he rose up. Now, imagine a man stoned, standing up. And not only that, it says, and went into the city. It doesn't say they carried his body into the city. It says he stood up and he went into the city. It says the next day, not next year, next day, he went with Barnabas and they went on their missionary journey. They went to Derby and said they preached over there. Now, humanly speaking, this is not possible. Here was a man who was stoned, left for dead. How is he even going to stand up? He must have been bleeding all over, all over his body. Not one small cut. He must have been bleeding all over. He was carrying about on the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. He was delivered to death for Jesus' sake. But something happened. The life of Jesus is manifested in our body. The life of Jesus is manifested in our mortal flesh. He stood up. And he walked back into the same city where, you know, the people who stoned him, he didn't walk the opposite direction. He walked back to the same direction. Not afraid. And the next day, he continues on his journey. In the natural, if somebody has been stoned, they will take about six months to recover. They will have to be bandaged, carried to the hospital. They would have to be treated there. Stoned and left for dead means it's not small cuts here and there. It'll take at least six months to get back. 
But here he gets up, he walks, and then he leaves the next day. So the point is this. Paul, when he says, the spirit who raised Jesus from the dead is giving life to your mortal body. God is giving life to your mortal body. The life of Jesus is made manifest. He's talking about something supernatural. He's talking about the Holy Spirit imparting healing, wholeness to our bodies. So, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. What is death? Anything that is working destruction in our body, the Holy Spirit sets us free. So I want you to understand this, take it to heart, that the Holy Spirit in you not only sets us free from the law of sin, but also from death that works in our bodies. Okay, we will take our break, I'll come back and yeah, we will uh, dwell on this a little uh, further and uh, we will uh, you know, take up any of these questions as well. Okay. Um, think about what we just read, read and heard. And we come back after the break and we'll take up questions and go forward. Okay. Thank you. We're back in 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. 